another episode of the Pro Wrestling Society podcast. I'm here with Pitbull Duke Snyder, and today we're going to do a shoot interview. How are you today? Oh, keeping busy as always. Uh, Easter Sunday, technically speaking, just another day, another day at the job, another day at the gym. And uh, thus far, uh, at least uh, there's progress ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So uh, my first question I want to ask you is um, what got you into pro wrestling? time, back in uh, the Bruno era, the year was 1974, I had been working for the New York Telephone Company as a technician, and uh, my wife at the uh, time had uh, become pregnant with our uh, second son, and uh, in need of uh, additional money, I turned to uh, pro wrestling. I had wrestled in high school. I won a first place trophy back in 1969 in my senior year uh, for uh, collegiate uh, wrestling. And uh, it was in the uh, light uh, heavyweight division. And uh, I stayed active uh, straight up until uh, 74 when I uh, met uh, a wrestling trainer who was gracious enough to train me. Nice. (laughs) Got to support. You know, your your family and spouse, um, you know. So, um, so could you give us some background in, into, uh, you know, your life before you got into wrestling? Well, uh, as I say, I was a high school athlete. I was always into one-on-one sports. I never cared very much for team sports. And uh, I uh, got into athletics uh, at age uh, 15. And uh, I maintain a trend to this very day. Uh, I was working as a technician for the uh, New York uh, Telephone Company. And uh, that lasted about uh, 10 years. As I said, in 1974, during the Bruno era, I became a pro wrestler, and I stayed a pro wrestler until 1979, uh, when I had to uh, put that on uh, hold, because I resigned from the phone company, and I uh, did a 20-year hitch with the uh, New York City uh, Department of uh, Corrections, uh, assigning me as an officer to uh, Rikers Island Prison Complex. I was... uh, I was there straight up until 99. In 1982, after my probation was finished, I decided to uh, go back to uh, pro wrestling. And I was uh, maintaining a delicate balance between being a corrections officer and being a uh, pro wrestler. And I stayed a pro wrestler until... I decided that the uh, business itself was becoming uh, too uh, comical. Uh, It went from uh, being a uh, sport to uh, being something less than less than a competition. It became an outright uh, three ring circus. (laughs) And and if I wanted to be a clown, I would have joined Ringling Brothers. So uh, therefore, therefore I just uh, dropped it all in uh, 2000 October of 2001. And most unfortunately, the way the business is today, I <laughs> certainly did not miss it. Yeah, unfortunately, it's it's just become it's gone down the drain, and uh, um, you know, like it's now the wrestling, the actual wrestling, is non-existent, and now we just have sports entertainment, and and uh, you know, and 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 it's. Um, I mean, all the technical stuff, the the actual submissions, it's, it's becoming, you know, less and less, and and, and now we're you're, it's <laughs> it's it's just become, it, and it's not even like entertaining anymore. It's at least for the, I don't know about you know the indie side of it, but the but the mainstream wrestling, gosh, it's 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 just going downhill, and. uh 
But uh, <laughs> but we'll get into that more in the interview. Um, next question I want to ask you is, uh, what's the hardest thing about being a pro wrestler? Like, what problems did you have to face in the business? Well, people who see pro wrestling, whether it's uh, mainstream or independent or anything of that nature, all they see is the uh, glitter of the lights. Uh, they look at everyone who walks into that ring as being some kind of a superstar. Unfortunately, what, uh, what the fans do not see is, uh, you know, the long trips, the gas stations, the vending machines, the cheap hotel rooms, <laughs> wow. promoters that are uh, giving you excuses rather than giving you a pay night, and general um, hardships. Uh, you're without uh, the benefit of your family for an extended period of time. Uh, if you're lucky, maybe you can call home once every 24 hours. And uh, chances are, every time you do call home, you're going to wind up arguing over the phone anyway because of the time that you're spending away from home. Mm. And this is why the uh, divorce and separation rate in pro wrestling is uh, as high as it actually is. It's all that domestic tension that it causes as well. Fans don't don't see these things the wrestlers do yeah like even for celebrities um you know people they see the the glitz and glamour they see the stardom they think wow what a life but it's actually um you know that's pretty interesting how how the the personal lives of the wrestlers is not as as uh, happy as they as they seem to present it like like I know Michael Jackson, he, uh, you know, he was, he, I watched one of his interviews. He said something about how he was happy. Like it seemed like he was happy, but he was actually suffering from depression and whatnot. And, and, and he lost his freedom, you know, at being a star and he couldn't go where he wanted because every time he did, um, there'd be a bunch of fans around and, and whatnot. And, and pestering him and trying, you know, and, and I don't know, like I heard stories about a bunch of wrestlers going through the same thing where, where, uh, you know, fans would, would constantly be coming up to them asking for autographs and whatnot. And a whole bunch of stuff that's pretty rough, you know, being on the road 24 seven, um, and, and just, you know, a whole bunch of seeing a whole bunch of stuff. It's like, like Wow. <laughs> well, like I say, it's definitely not an easy way to live. And uh, back in the Bruno era, at least, as hard as it might have been, you were able to make a living at it. Today, with the independent uh, circuit such as it is, and many of the independent promoters that there are, if you can call them promoters, uh, you wind up making a long trip and chances are they're not even paying you enough to uh, stay in a motel overnight. We had a situation with a former uh, WWE uh, champion who went independent and did a show somewhere uh, in one of the southern states, and they paid him so little that night that he had to park his car in a park, and he had to sleep in the back seat of his car because they didn't give him enough for a cheap uh, motel, and this is this is what happens to uh, some some of the best of the boys. You get some of them that were in, in, the, pro, in the presence of ninety three thousand people at a WrestleMania, and now all of a sudden they're wrestling at, a, at an American Legion Hall, which has a capacity of maybe four hundred people, and the promoters couldn't care less what happens to you as long as you show up and you do your uh, thing. It's, uh, it's become pathetic. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's just crazy. I mean, that's not like, that's just inhumane. The stuff they do. I heard a lot of stories about it. Like, like I heard one, they, they don't even pay. Sometimes they don't even pay them anything. It's just, um, maybe it's like I heard from other people. They said it's as low as like 10 bucks, maybe 20 or something, uh, for per match in the uh, indie circuit. But, but uh wow that's just 
That's crazy. And I heard they ripped them off too. Like, um, you know, it's like, you know, they'll, they'll tell them, oh, I'll give you, you know, this much. And, and then they end up not doing it. So, you know, corruption is uh, pretty rampant. But how, how, um, you know, how rampant was it in, in uh, was the corruption in your era? Originally, it really wasn't that bad when it all started out. Because uh, if a promoter gave you a guarantee on something, chances are you got what you bargained for. You have guys like um, uh, Terry Funk. Now, Terry, back at the time when he was running a franchise of the NWA, should have been nominated to sainthood. I say this because when he promised a wrestler that he would pay them a $500 pay night, chances are if the box office was better than expected, he'd give that man 600 or better. Terry was wonderful when it came to uh, taking care of the boys. You know, his uh, I would say that his disposition was always taken as being somewhat negative. However, he never violated the business. He never hurt a worker. He never did anybody wrong. He never shortchanged anybody. And uh, he was he was a wonderful promoter. He was a good worker. He was a wonderful promoter, too. I personally had the highest respect for him. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I watched one of the ECW documentaries on on him, and they said that that uh, he was a good locker room leader. He would try to, you know, uh, help other people out, help help upcoming wrestlers get big and, and earn their spots and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, I believe it. I, I believe that he's uh, probably one of the most talented hardcore wrestlers of, of uh, probably of all time. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, so what, what in your opinion makes a good wrestler? Well, today you don't find too many of them, unfortunately. What makes, <laughs> a good wrestler, what makes a good wrestler, in my opinion, was someone who uh, spent more time in the gym than uh, most others. Today, a lot of them either spend time drinking or getting high because uh, drugs is a rampant thing right now in the business, or uh, doing something else that's uh, harmful to their uh, reputations. Uh, When I was uh, starting out, I was in that gym more often than I was at the job site. I really trained like crazy. If I wasn't in the gym, I was running a track down at the park. I was doing anything and everything I could to uh, sharpen my skills and keep me physically fit. Today, the way everything is, nobody looks at things from a serious viewpoint. Nobody takes anything serious. And worse yet, far worse than many other things, it's this backyard nonsense that's uh, going on that's really destroying the uh, business more than anything else. Because you get some backyard wrestlers that have never been in the gym, never trained, never been in a ring, they're in the backyard somewhere, bouncing around on a mattress, oh, and they honestly believe that's going to make them a pro wrestler. And then some crooked, money-hungry, thieving promoter will take two of these backyard fools and have them go out and sell, sell some tickets for them. And if they can get some ticket sales for them, they'll put them in the ring and let them wrestle in front of an audience, which only compounds things worse. Was a promoter that will do a thing like that has no regard for the true ethics of the business, nor do they have any respect for the business when you put untrained idiots in that ring and uh, you permit them to do what they do. 95% of the time, it's going to result in some kind of a serious accident. And then, of course, the promoter will generally red, 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 run out of the state somewhere and hide. I've seen this before, and it wouldn't surprise me. Wow, yeah, that's that's what I've been talking about in one of my episodes where I I pretty much like said that backyard backyard wrestling should not you know should not be done at all because um you know the, these kids they 
they're just doing these crazy things like falling, you know, like playing with fire and barbed wire and all these sorts of weapons and somebody could really get hurt. And, you know, it's, it's just ridiculous how they, they do these things and, and, and they don't want, but they don't understand the, the entirety of, of the situation. They don't understand how, how to actually wrestle. I mean, they don't understand. It's like it's like they want to wrestle, but but they don't want to get into the politics of of of, of the business and and everything that goes on to you know, and because there's it's just more. I mean, you know, it's just more. It's more than to it than what they think it is, and 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 for the promoters to do that. Oh my gosh, that's that's. Well, crazy. I've had some serious arguments with some promoters back at the time because that was precisely what it was that they were doing. They were letting these clowns in the ring and they were um, doing something extremely unethical, something that promoters should never do. We had one case um, back in uh, what was it, February of 2000, I believe, when I uh, did a show for a uh, promotion and a promoter that has since moved to uh, Florida. And in it, uh, to protect the innocent, I'm simply not mentioning names, he had one character there who had only had one wrestling lesson, mind you, one lesson, and he broke his hand uh, practicing how to take his uh, bumps. So being that he was assisting this promoter financially with the shows that he was running, the promoter gave him uh, clearance or uh, whatever you'd want to call it to uh, run in and uh, do interference in uh, some of the matches, as we call, doing run-ins. And he was never without that kendo stick that he was always running around with. And one night, just before one of those shows, I confronted the character in the locker room, and I told him straight out that uh, what he does with other wrestlers and what they put up with is their business. You run any interference in my match, and I guarantee you, they will take you out of this place on a slab tonight, because I'll break every bone in your body if you inter if you interfere without authorization in my match. And that kendo stick will not save your life. I promise you. He learned how to back off. <laughs> and, uh, like I say, he wouldn't have been doing these things if that promoter had not been permitting him to do so. And I put that promoter on notice as well, that if he should ever come in that ring without my knowledge or without authorization or anything like that while I'm in that ring, it will be the sorriest moment of his life. And that's that's where that nonsense ended. You know, there are times where you have to draw the line. And I've been a pro too long to let something as unprofessional as that uh, get itself involved in anything that I was doing. Well, what a way to lay down the line, but I mean, it had to be done. So, cause it's like, this is, you know, this is your life we're talking about. This is your health we're talking about. And for them to do that, it's, 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 uh, you know, like I said, somebody could get seriously hurt or, you know, and wow, it's just, uh, I think today it's just, it's just become so open compared to, back then i mean i mean it's it's just the standards have dropped so much uh i mean i think if i if i can recall correctly um back then it wasn't as like only a select few could join and now it's um you know correct me if i'm wrong but now it's just now anybody can join and 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 unfortunately the wrong people have gotten it <laughs> definitely the wrong people have gotten in it people that shouldn't even be in it and and it's just it's just ruining it or it's it's already been ruined uh quite a lot i mean like well worse than ruined it's been destroyed yeah pretty now, much now i uh i must confess at this time that back in uh 2001 october 2001 uh, October 30th. That was my final uh, show. That was my final farewell uh, because I resigned to the business immediately after. Now, did you ever, have you ever heard 
of the uh, quote unquote manager, uh, Dangerous Johnny Diamond? No, I never heard of him. Just as well that you didn't, because if you didn't, don't go looking him up. He wasn't worth it. <laughs> uh, uh, this fool, this lying con merchant, who was someone that I've known for many years, uh, had asked me repeatedly, could I get him involved in wrestling as a manager? That was his dream. That was his hope. That was his wish. That was everything. And I made the mistake of getting him involved as a manager. And I do say it was a mistake because some years ago on uh, one of the uh, wrestling radio shows, I did make a public apology to all wrestlers as well as to the fans for bringing, for making the mistake of bringing him into the business as a manager. Now, he got involved with, uh, with the Federation just as I was leaving. He got involved only because the uh, promoter was told that he could sell a mess of tickets for him. So first off, his word to me about this uh, diamond was, he says, I don't want to know anything about him. I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to look at him. He's nothing but another mark. He's just another glorified fan. That's all he is. And then when the character approached him, he tells him, he says, hey, listen, I can sell about a thousand tickets for you. Then all of a sudden, he wanted to put him to work. Because he said, I could sell a million tickets. Well, that's precisely what he uh, said, but needless to say, there was no real uh, truth to it. Uh, the fact was, he was given a stack of tickets before every show. He bought the tickets himself and handed the cash to the promoter and said that he had sold them. That's how much he wanted to get into the spotlight. And it didn't take him long to learn the ways of the business as the business has become. Because he instantly became a liar, a thief a con merchant, and everything else that went along with, uh, with with what it's all turned into today. And that was where I lost any possible respect that I could have had for him. And I told him at that point, I said, you'll do yourself a big favor if you never call me again and you stay out of my life. I lost all my respect for you because you're nothing but a liar and I can't believe a word that you say. And I just let it all go with that. Uh, from what I understand, he became so alienated from everybody that uh, he uh, died from some uh, ailment or something or other while uh, alone at, at, at Dennis' house uh, just a few years ago, whatever the case may be. It doesn't sound like a very nice thing for me to say, but I truly do not miss him because of what he turned himself into. And that is part and parcel of what the business today is all about. Wow, that's that's insane. I mean... Uh, man, that's that's just so corrupt. I mean, like, um, yeah, I've I've heard a bunch of, I mean, a cases similar to that, but but wow, it's it's a uh, man, it's 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 a uh, unbelievable how just how the standards have dropped and whatnot and. And uh, wow! And 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 uh, speaking of um, you know, going back to the point you said about uh, bodybuilding, I did notice that. I, I noticed that uh, in the wrestlers now, it's like they're just doing taking drugs and steroids and whatnot, and actually maybe sometimes even selling drugs and and uh, doing all these things in, in their bodies and. Uh, you know, junk food and whatnot, and and uh, I think this play this also plays a part in it. Like, like uh, you know, it's it's. They're, what do you think about all the dangerous moves that they're doing? Um, you know, like falling twenty feet down a a, a scaffold or stuff like that. <laughs> I, I was waiting for you to ask me that. <laughs> These things have nothing to do with wrestling in any capacity. It has to do with uh, stuntmen uh, simply uh, jumping off the scaffolds or off of ladders or uh, things of that nature. That's all it actually is. What does that have to do with a wrist lock or a leg lock or a reversal or a forearm smash or a body slam or anything like that? I mean, 
yes. coming right down to it. Isn't that the way Owen Hart got killed? Yeah, he he. Um, I heard somebody he tried to do a stunt where he he would uh, you know, he would get lowered from the scaffold to the ring, but some but an uh accident happened. And he fell like a good few feet. Uh, high. He fell like a good like I don't know how many feet, but. Yeah, he fell all the way down to the bottom, and he died for, as a result of that. So that's that's insane. But uh, yes, yeah. yes, it is insane, and that thing should have never been sanctioned, authorized, or performed, because that man was by title a pro wrestler. He was not a stunt man, and as a result of that, the Hart family lost a son, and that was a heartbreaker. It never should have happened. Yeah, I I uh, I do see your point there. I mean, I, it just it's it's like I said. I mean, it's it's become you know so far removed from from actual wrestling and become more more of a of a, a stunt man kind of thing. And and there is a difference between. You know, wrestling and doing and you know stunt work like that i mean i mean but stuff like that like happens quite i mean now it's there's just full of videos of them doing stuff like that and i even talked to it i had this debate with one of a fan uh one of the fans he i, I said i tried to explain to him that what they're doing now is sports entertainment it's not actually wrestling as as we as uh as it is or as it was in the past and <laughs> and he still believes that it's that today is what they're doing today is wrestling and I just gave up at that point because there's no convincing them and and uh you know I <laughs> um but man the only the only time I really Sorry, enjoyed watching some kind of a uh, gimmick happened back in 1991 uh, during Operation Desert Storm. Uh, one of the indie wrestlers, and I, I always, I always liked this fellow, uh, Jimmy Deal. I always liked Jimmy. Jimmy was, he was one of the most stand-up guys. But one night we were at a show in Jersey, and I was a little worried about him. And I took him aside and I told him, I said, you know, Jerry, you know, Jimmy. I don't know if what you're doing is a very good idea. There's a lot of people right now who um, are pretty upset about what's uh, going on in the Middle East because he put on an outfit that made him look like some kind of a sheik, and he was going to run out out there and uh, more or less fabricate uh, speaking in Arabic uh, and uh, carrying on about uh, some of the upcoming matches. And Jimmy told me, he says, Duke, he says, not to worry. He says, let me tell you. What I'm doing is I'm going out there with this outfit and I'm going to play the clown. Can you think of a better time and a better set of circumstances than to make a clown out of some Middle Eastern cheek of some sort? And I said to him, I said, you know something? You're smarter than I am when it comes to these things. <laughs> and he was very <laughs> successful because everybody was hysterical laughing, including the fellows in the locker room that were watching him. He put on a very good show. I. Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, oh I, thought, I thought we got separated. <laughs> uh, all in all, he was very entertaining. Did a job, and I, basically, I'm not a gimmick person, but he really put on a very good show that night. And I, really, I really enjoyed uh, Jimmy's uh, performance. But what's going on today has very little or nothing to do with uh, wrestling. You have... Uh, Bodybuilders, prima donnas, everyone who's in love with himself, stepping on everybody else's neck in order to climb the ladder. Nobody cares about anyone. It's, it's uh, look out for number one. <laughs> and business, like I said, the business has taken a drop. I seriously believe that within 10 years, pro wrestling is going to go the way of uh, roller derby. And hardly anybody even knows what roller derby is anymore. Okay. So I, I foresee pretty much the same thing happening because... People are just losing interest in the soap opera that it's become. Yeah, and if I can remember correctly, um, like wrestling as a sport died uh, around. Um, can't remember exactly the year, but 
uh, I think it was like centuries ago, two maybe two centuries ago, and because people were losing interest, so they decided to to try to um, put in the sports entertainment, uh, make it into sports entertainment, and that's how they were able to generate that much interest. But then, but now it's not even entertaining anymore. Now it's it's just become a hot. It's just, it's just become destroyed. And I feel like, I feel like one of these days, you know, wrestling is just going to go back. It's just going to die. You know I mean, point it's plain and simple. It's just going to become like you said. And I mean, you know, I'm a fan of some gimmicks. Um, you know, some, some, some of the storyline aspects and, and whatnot and, and entertainment aspects but but uh, i mean it's uh now they don't even do that anymore now it's they don't even have uh characters anymore now it's just a guy a guy puts on a suit or, or makeup and he just goes out in the ring playing dress up <laughs> and he's and and what he does it makes no sense i mean he it's it's not even enter- what he does is not even entertaining. I mean, it's it's just uh, it's gone down the drain. Worse than that, actually, it's it's not even. Well, let's go out there, and for the sake of an audience, and for the sake of the attention that they'll receive, they go in that ring and they just simply play the fool. Nothing more, <laughs> nothing less. Yeah. You, see, you see no holds. You see no escape maneuvers. You see no counter uh, measures. You see nothing. There's nothing going on there but just plain buffoonery. Yeah, now it's just a bunch of flip floppy sequences and and uh, and, you know just signature move after signature move and and um, body slamming. Um, I don't even know it. I don't even know what they do anymore. But it, they do. It's just ridiculous and. And then they do a finishing move that just means nothing, and and then they pin somebody, and and that's the end of it. <laughs> and like, there's just, you know, and there's no. Um, I remember when I watched wrestling, I I, I was into the, the uh, the chokeholds, legitimate chokeholds, um, the actual you know, technical stuff, but it's, it seems now, it, I don't even know what they do anymore. It seems like they're just, uh, like, I don't know how to describe it, but their moves are just garbage. Uh, which kind of, I kind of want to ask you this now, now that, now that we've talked about that, let's, I want to talk, I want to ask you, like, what do you think about the, the WWE? <laughs> like that, you got to be prepared to get the answer. And my response to the WWE is the simple fact that when the day comes that that charade goes belly up and no longer exists, I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy a bottle of champagne (laughs) and I'm going to pop that cork because... I remember a time in this country where we had three major league federations and wrestlers were never out of work. We had the American Wrestling Association, the National Wrestling Alliance, and the WWWF. When your contract expired with one, you were able to go directly to the other. And you were always working. Now, because of backstabbing, throat slashing, treachery, all these different things, the only show in town for the full-time pro is the WWE. The other two have been put out of business. And I say that it was the worst atrocity ever committed against other businesses in this country as it was against those other two federations. Treachery, throat slashing, nothing more, nothing less. I have absolutely no use or respect for the WWE in any capacity, nor do I have any respect for its administration and its leadership. Completely agree with you. I, I've been ranting about it like for years and years, and, and I'm almost just it's 
it's just uh the stuff they did is is just completely um i don't i don't even know if barbaric is the word it, it's just it's or corrupt it's it's just hideous it's so it's so backwards honestly this i mean and and yeah you're completely right about that i mean uh from what from what I understand, Vince McMahon he he uh, he has this sort of these sort of predatory tactics where he felt the need to to stay on top, even at the expense of other companies, bringing them down and whatnot, putting people out of business, out of work, out of business, and it was horrible. I mean, uh, his ego was just that big that he felt the need to not let anybody else other than his company make money. It's like he was trying to uh, make WWE the sole definition of pro wrestling itself. And this is pretty sickening, honestly, maybe sick to my stomach, just seeing all the stuff they were doing and the backstabbings and and whatnot. And um, not to mention he's, he's ruined some careers because for some odd reason, maybe because he didn't like them or whatnot. And, um, I just, I get riled up talking about the WWE because it's just, it's the product is garbage. Now it's worse than garbage. It's just terrible. It's like, I even said one time, I mean, and on, on social media that I'm just, from now on, I'm just going to pretend that it doesn't exist <laughs> in my mind. And if it goes under that, I'm probably going to, going to celebrate or something because it's, it's just gone so downhill. <laughs> well, it's gone worse than downhill. It's crashed and burned when you come right down to it. Now, as far as Vince McMahon Jr. is concerned, I say this, you know, people have different expressions pretty much for the same thing. You know, they say, you know, all, all roads uh, lead to Rome. Okay. You get some people who say what goes around comes around. Other people say karma, as I do. Archie Bunker would say the man upstairs sees everything. On the average, uh, average uh, street people say God don't like ugly. Or you'll get, get, you'll get what's coming to you eventually. Or whatever the case may be. And I'll tell you this once again, when he gets what's coming to him, I'm not only going to pour myself a glass of champagne, I'm going to light an expensive cigar, and I am just going to gloat. Because his day, just like most others, his day is coming, and I'll be very happy when I see it. (laughs) Same here, he's going to. Um, yeah, I, I just can't wait until somebody does the same thing to him. And I'm almost, I'm almost just, just wanting that to happen in a way. I just, you know, cause I want him, I want some kind of justice to be done about it. Like sometimes I just, you know, I, I sometimes <laughs> it's almost as if I just want to pray for the WWE's downfall because, you know, he's just. He's done a lot of bad things. Like I read a case where he got arrested for for uh, for sexually harassing a referee, a female referee, passing out steroids and whatnot, and looking the other way when a wrestler does a crime and whatnot because it he, he was trying to basically put money in his pockets. He didn't want to lose that money, so he was just. I've heard a lot about him. He's just done so much wrong and, and, uh, you know, somebody just needs to put a stop to it all, and, uh, <laughs> whether it be God or somebody else. Cause I mean, <laughs> if, it, if, w, if the WWE goes down, <laughs> I'm probably, like I said, I'm going to celebrate. I mean, cause you know, it's, it's just, it's become so bad. I, I mean, I heard that, that, uh, they're planning to WWE is planning to get sold to Disney or whatnot. And that was, that was just the last straw. I, <laughs> that was, I was just like, you know what? I'm, I'm done with this. Like, I didn't even know how to process that. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, as I say, by whatever means, however, I would like very much to 
see that company crash and burn, and I would love to see him get exactly what he deserves. And whatever it is, it just simply will never be enough, in my opinion. Right. You know, the thing of it is, is that you've mentioned some of the things that he has allegedly uh, done. Uh, now, I could either um, say yes or no. I'm not an eyewitness. I'm not an ear witness. I didn't see him do anything of that nature. But then again, by knowing his ego and how much he loves himself, I have no reason to deny that any, any of these things have uh, likely taken place. Now, from 79 to 99, I was, uh, as I say, I was assigned to uh, Rikers Island as a corrections officer. And after a period of time to this very moment, if there's anything that I can't stomach, it's something of a criminal nature. It's something that condones some, you know, any form of uh, lawlessness uh, behavior or any type of uh, crime or anything of that nature. You know, I developed those uh, values as time went on, and my values have not changed. <clears throat> and if he is, in fact, guilty of uh, some of the allegations that you just made, what what is uh, what's awaiting him in the future is indescribable because it all catches up sooner or later. Amen to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's... Uh, and even even when he presents him, every time he presents himself, it's like, I notice that all the wrestlers, uh, almost all of them, it's, you can tell that they don't like him. They hate him. They, they don't want to say it, but, but you, by their demeanor, by by their facial expressions, by the stuff they say, it's like you could tell they absolutely don't like him. Some people do like him, but probably the only people who like him is probably his family, everybody else. I mean, not even the fans like him, and that's saying a lot. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he, I definitely agree with you. He's, he's going to get what's coming to him one way or another, and it's going to happen whether in this life or the next. Um So, uh, yeah, so, so how did you train as a professional wrestler, um, you know, back in... Well, it, it'll strike you funny when I tell you that uh, to this very day, I haven't uh, changed my, uh, you know, my, my training regimen. I did a lot of weight training, in addition to weight training that I was doing, and still do, uh, I have in my own private gym, I still keep a, a heavy bag that I uh, work out with, in addition to a speed bag, whereas, uh, you know, you develop um, enough uh, arm muscle, but if you train the right way, throw those punches, throw 600 punches a day, uh, you will not get arm weary, nor will you get muscle bound. I'm still, um, you know, I still uh, do some uh, road work as often as I possibly can, and uh, I... Although my uh, my doctors advise me that at age 67, I should not be lifting heavy weights. Well, I say this, as I told one doctor some time ago, that, and I quote myself as saying, all you doctors are good for is making the undertakers rich because I have no intention of changing my training regimen. And I don't. I feel wonderful after every workout, and I'm just going to continue on until trading becomes obsolete. <laughs> wow, that's some strong words right there. <laughs> yeah, it seems like the doctors, uh, I, sometimes they just piss me off because the stuff they say, it's, uh, it's just ridiculous. Uh, oh my gosh, I don't even know where to start. I mean, like I had one doctor ask me about... Um, I had a condition and I went to the doctor and, and then he asked me, why, well, why didn't you go sooner? You know, why, why didn't, and I was like, <laughs> what kind of question is that? It's like, are you trying to blame me for, you know, for, for, for my condition? I, I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's just <laughs> and. Well, 
Well, we can both laugh. You see, the only thing I ever broke in the ring was my nose. And I had my, my nose smashed into my face 12 separate times. But that's, that's nothing. The majority of the injuries that I ever got always seemed to come from the weight gym and not from uh, wrestling. Now, I had a residual uh, lower back injury way back that was taken care of back in 2005. I thought it was a herniated lumbar disc, but what it actually turned out to be was a dislocated uh, vertebra. And uh, I knew I needed surgery. There was no question about that there. So you start off with the general practitioner who sent me to a neurologist. And this uh, neurologist was, uh, w w was a real trip because he looks at the x-ray slides. He sees an immense separation between these two uh, lower vertebrae. And he sees exactly what my problem is. And then this quack, can I tell you, this quack tells me, he says, well, some time ago, we would have... Um, authorized surgery for you, but we're not going to go the surgical route. We're going to give you injections. And oh, I okay. told him, I said, you will will give me injections in a pig's eye. <laughs> I am not going to take periodic injections of cortisone that's eventually going to break my body down altogether and do absolutely nothing to correct the problem that I have. And I just walked right out of his office. A surgeon did, in fact, uh, take care of the problem for me. Because what the man did was he moved everything back into place and actually uh, riveted the thing to the uh, pelvic bone. I was operated on on Monday. I was sent home on Thursday. And I was back in the gym the Friday of the following week. Wow. Yeah, it's this is just really, it's really frustrating how doctors can be so quacky and, and just to say stuff like this and recommend stuff like this i mean you know i had doctors do a, it's like they're just doing a half-baked job with 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 what they're doing and and uh it's like they lack they just lack some major skills i mean i i, have, I don't even know uh their background but they're doing a pretty crappy job at, at at what they're doing i mean as far as that it's like it's like they want to give you these over-the-counter meds and and that's not really what a doctor should be doing in his or her profession uh, well, well the code of ethics today in the medical profession is no longer um being uh, you know the doctor being a healer uh you know a doctor uh curing your sick people it has nothing to do with that anymore Today, what they do is they do not treat the patient, they treat the ailment. The object of it is rather than cure the patient, whereas you will not be able to make any money on a healthy person, you see to it that they keep the problem that they have, but you just mask it with medications, which only serves to make the pharmaceutical companies rich. Yeah. That is how they work today. It's really disgusting, and 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 I uh, I've been doing like research on that. Speaking of which, uh, I believe you know I, I've talked about how the the Food and Drug Administration has been, um, you know, basically uh, making money off of unhealthy people. They actually don't want healthy people to, um, people to be healthy because. They lose money off of it, and and uh, as far as vitamin, like like I just the other day, uh, I looked at a, a supplement of vi uh, uh, this bottle of vitamins, and it said that this has not been approved by the FDA and and has not been tested for something. So, and I was like, I lost it. I went berserk. I was just like, how is this? Uh, Oh my goodness! I don't even know where to begin with that. I think, I think honestly, I really do believe that that there is some sort of of cure for many of the world's diseases, but it's not through um, the medical industry as it is today. I mean, I, I believe that it's through, um, you know, I, I believe that nature has already found. It's its way, so to speak. 
um, because I mean, it's like, I mean, people have been using herbs for centuries and for healing and all sorts of purposes. So uh, I find it hard to believe that, you know, there isn't a, a cure because I mean, there's, they put a lot of stuff in, 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 uh, in drugs and, and, you know, you go to your local pharmacy and, and you look at the side effects and, and some of those are pretty damaging to your health. Um, you know, like causes serious problems. Um, well, have you ever seen some of the new types of drugs that they advertise on TV and they give you a whole rundown of what the side effects are likely to be? You're, you're safer having the ailment than you are having the cure when you come right down to it. Because that's how a lot of these things work. They do more damage to you than what it is that you're being treated for. Now, frankly, I take a variety of food supplements every day over the course of the day as well. And anybody who tells me that these things don't work simply is are not worth either listening to <laughs> or talking with. Because if they didn't work, I would neither buy them nor use them. And right. uh, there is, uh, like I say, there, as you say, yes, there are natural means for natural cures. The Food and Drug Administration will not recognize it based on the fact that it's not medicine. And if you take note of uh, medications, how many things today do they classify as a disease? Too many things. Even when a child behaves like a spoiled brat, they say that's a disease. They call everything a disease because calling it a disease means it's got to be treated pharmaceutically. And if it's treated pharmaceutically, well, once again, the drug companies get rich or richer. That's how this little game works. It's a matter of semantics when you really come right down to it. Everything is a disease, so therefore, everything has got to be treated uh, with uh, drugs. And it's uh, to me, it's worse than a joke. It's very critical. It's very dangerous. You know, people were, were far better off at a time when the only treatment that they could get was from the old country doctor who knew how to treat people with proper diet and with uh, proper uh, herbal treatment. Unfortunately, we don't see that anymore. Those days have come and gone. It's up to the individual right now to take care of their own health. Right. And I heard something, speaking of that, I heard of a case of of this lady who, who would make herbal remedies for reportedly she she found the cure to cancer um somewhere in i can't remember the country i think it was in mexico or someplace and the government namely the food and drug administration they try to shut it down um they try at first they try to denounce it as a fraud and and uh, then they try to uh ban it and, and actually go to the place and do God knows what, uh, pretty much shut the place down. And, and, uh, I was, I was just like, wow, this, this, uh, you know, I just think about stuff like that. It's, it's crazy how more than insane, it's just unbelievable how, how far, um, you know, the, people are especially in the government how far they'll go to actually destroy people's health and lives and 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 for the for the name of money and or some other agenda I, I always tell people so that they need to you know they need to get educated and see these things because the government is taking advantage of them in in any way they can i mean it's Society is just becoming so brainwashed into believing that uh, that the only sole cure is is uh, is is the FDA. Whatever the FDA says, it's law, and they have to accept it. And it's just not really, um, not really true. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you look at all I mean, all these so-called primitive societies and they've they've discovered a lot of things um long before modern science has even discovered them and and uh but it's 
so corrupt how now it's like they're trying to shut it down. They're not trying to trying to destroy people's health, health and 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 uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you heard about this, but uh, I think the owner of McDonald's, uh, you know, he didn't feed his daughter. He doesn't feed his kids uh, the food that they give, you know, McDonald's, none of that. So he doesn't feed He feeds them healthy food. And and, <laughs> and that's pretty sickening, honestly, because and it's, it's shocking how how much that tells a, that says a lot, because you think about all the amount of stuff they put in in the fast food restaurants and you know whatnot and it's, it's just become so polluted um well you have to look at uh, the types of uh, meat that they use in addition to uh, other uh, things that they uh, feed them and what they're selling to the uh, people as uh, fast food granted is not the uh, the healthiest thing that a person can eat you do better off uh, having a pound of uh, cooked beef than uh, having uh, two um, two of these fast food hamburgers or something or other because well the stuff that generally goes into the meat and plus uh, I don't believe that that's the highest quality of meat that can actually be used. <laughs> that's why they call it fast food. Fast food is most certainly not yeah. the best thing for you. Uh, the only thing I generally buy at a lot of these fast food places is usually a cup of coffee and usually that's black coffee. And uh, I stay away from the food in general. It's usually extremely starchy. You, your body certainly doesn't eat excessive starch. You know, you take a look today and you see why uh, so many people have diabetes, especially uh, young kids, you know, who get very little or no exercise and who spend most of the day eating uh, junk food. And that does have an impact on the uh, body's uh, organs, especially the pancreas. And this is why uh, diabetes in itself is uh, as rampant as it is. It all has a lot to do with our diet. Right. And and speaking of diet, um, uh, you know, I read, and, and, and this goes back to what I said about uh, what we talked about in wrestling. Um, I think one of the pioneers of, of, of pro wrestling um George Hagensmith, he would he uh, he stressed the importance of nutrition and physical uh, fitness, bodybuilding, and wrestling. Um, you know, he he actually strived to be as healthy as he could be to wrestle, and he taught people to do the same, especially wrestlers. You know, he was such an iconic figure, and and now it the business has drifted so far away from that. And um, now it, they don't even try anymore. It's like, it's like, it's just run on drugs and, and, and uh, now well, it's, George you know. We tell you, George Hackensmith will be well remembered, reason being. For one thing, during his uh, heyday in uh, the business, he was commonly referred to as the Russian Lion. Yeah. Uh, now, George, if you've seen any of his old black and white pictures, that man not only uh, was a pro wrestler, he could have been a bodybuilder, too, because of how well sculptured his body was. Now, he is the man who they named the hack squat after. Wow. Because of the way he used to do his squats. They yeah. built a machine back in the 60s, and, and it was uh, widely distributed in the gymnasiums uh, called the hack squat machine. And it was named after George uh, Hackenschmidt. And uh, George, you see, was just like um, Stanislaus uh, Zabisco and uh, Hans Steinke and uh, all of the old-time greats. These men were fantastic match-style wrestlers. They knew every hold, every move, every counter-move. They were wonderful. Most unfortunately, today, by today's... Um, standards, if we can call it that, or by the type of crowds that uh, attend the shows, if two men like that were to get into the ring and mix it up, within about five minutes, they'd be yelling, boring. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. It's an outright shame, because in 2000, <clears throat> I saw uh, two good pros, and I mean, these fellas were, both of they were better than I ever was, uh, Ace Darling and Devin Storm. And they gave the audience what was called an Iron Man match. 
they did not take a break, rest, or use one rest hold throughout the entire match. Constant moves, constant reversals, constant action. And these fellows were really wrestling. The crowd didn't like it. Oh. The crowd didn't like it. Wow. These two fellows were fabulous, and the crowd didn't like it. They'd yes. rather much, uh, you know, much rather see uh, see some uh, buffoonery going on in there or something <laughs> they could laugh at. Nobody wants to see real wrestling anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I have, uh, you know, I have such a, uh, you know, such a great appreciation for um, wrestling in in different generations, uh, uh, different styles, provided that it's done right. But back in the day, I mean, I've even had an appreciation for, uh, you know, old old school, really classic wrestling. Uh, because from my um, from what I've read, George Hackensmith, he I heard he was crazy fast during his his matches. It would and, um, you know, no, he was he had an undefeated streak, um, and it was legit. Uh, it wasn't uh, scripted or predetermined or anything like that. Uh, and yes, there was one match in particular where where uh, it would la- he l- it lasted for hours, and uh, you know they would try to they were actually applying legit moves, joint you know locks and s- submissions and stuff like that, and um. But it's such a shame that people don't see the art in it. They don't see the, you know, the just just how dynamic it really is, and how how um, how athletic it is, and and they don't they don't see any of that. I mean, uh, unfortunately. Um, you know, they'd rather watch someone like Roman Reigns or <laughs> or some 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 I don't even know what to call it anymore. They'd rather watch somebody who's not even wrestling. He's just just doing these these ridiculous moves that that look really bad. Honestly, <laughs> yeah, I, it's oh I, okay. So like. I think the worst match I ever saw today uh, had to be between these two women who uh, uh, I don't know if you heard of Nikki Bella or and this other girl uh, Charlotte like one okay so Nikki she she it was so cringe she she would uh, she would duck a clothesline and then and then run to the other side of the ropes and barely touch it and, and then and then just keep running awkwardly to the other side of the ring and then stops looks back and then gets speared <laughs> well that made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever it was just the worst thing i ever saw it was, oh my goodness so horrible <laughs> what, what do you think about that well I try very hard not to because you can't compare someone like that with some of the old time greats that really knew how to uh, uh, deal with a match. <laughs> you know, the fabulous, uh, may she rest in peace, June Byers, you know, these women. These women were, uh, they, they were female wrestlers and they were real ladies too. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the most entertaining matches I'd see between two female pros was back in April of uh, 91. When I watched uh, Misty Blue and uh, Cat LaRue in uh, you know, in a match, and these two women, let me tell you something: these two women were not only beautiful, but they could really move. I mean, they did they did more wrestling, you know, more legitimate wrestling in that match than some men do. Wow! And uh, they did a ter- they did a terrific uh, match that night. It's just a shame that everything has gone the way of the wind as it has. Yeah, I mean, I look at the woman back then, uh, and they were actually very, very talented. Um, you know, they, they actually, like, some of them were ripped. I mean, I mean ripped. And, um, you know, and they, they actually 
could, you know, like you said, compete at the same, either at the same level as the men or even better than the men. Uh, um, and now it, it's just, now it, they just become so devalued and so degraded, um, to a point where it's, they're just used no more than for eye candy, pretty much, uh, it's just so despicable. They're just, it's like now they're just doing these acrobatics, gymnastics and stuff like that. And it's not impressive to me at all. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, you know, and, and probably don't, they probably don't even work out. Um, who knows what they do, but, but, uh, Women back then, they were totally on a different level than the women of today. <laughs> Straight up like that. Well, like I said, back at the time, you had uh, female wrestlers that were not only good looking, but they could legitimately grapple, ju you know, just as uh, good as uh, men could. You know, they weren't afraid of uh, full contact. They were in very good shape. You know, they kept their uh, bodies together. And uh, these, these women were athletes. Today, all you got there is just a bunch of frustrated centerfolds that uh, are put out there so they can be looked at. And that's about it. There's there's no real talent anymore. Yeah, totally agree. Um, okay, so my next question is: uh, Which pro wrestlers were some of your inspirations? Uh, when I got in, before I got into the business. Uh, I observed a, an old pro, or may he rest in peace, he passed on back in 97, uh, Dick the Bulldog Brower. Now, I'd seen him on television. I had the honor of uh, seeing him wrestle in person at the Sunnyside Gardens Arena. And what really most impressed me about uh, Bulldog Brower was the fact that, despite the fact that he was just about my height, it didn't stop him from uh, becoming a renowned uh, wrestler and uh, becoming a very famous one at that. And it was uh, one of the happiest experiences of my life, some years after I turned pro, when I actually got to meet the man. And uh, he was, uh, I, I would say, judging by his basic behavior, he was just as crazy outside the ring as he was in front of that camera. But one thing I'll say about that man, he always knew money, he always knew how to earn that money, and nothing was more important to him in his life than his children. And I always respected him for that. Fritz von Erich was another one of my uh, favorite uh, pros. Uh, very, uh, very impressive. Then uh, there was Gene Kaniski, the ex-football star. Uh, Gene was, uh, you know, he didn't look like your classic wrestler. If you put him in a three-piece suit with a tie and gave him a slouch hat, he'd look more like an insurance salesman than a wrestler. But that man could have tied knots in a crowbar. And he was, and he was tough. He was a fantastic wrestler. One of the real old-time pros. Then there was Larry Hamilton, uh, commonly referred to as the Missouri Mauler. Uh, who was another one. Some of these guys, you see, they didn't have builds to uh, match their reputations. But as I say, they were some of the best wrestlers in history. And I really, um, I really enjoyed getting to know a lot of them. And uh, I was glad to be considered as uh, within the same class with them. Uh, these, these guys were really to be, be admired. Yeah, good list. You gotta remind me to look them up later on. <laughs> but uh yeah, I I um I agree with you. Um it seems like the guys who it's like today's there's this or I don't know at what period, but there's been a standard where uh certain wrestlers they had to look a certain way. Um and if they didn't look a certain way then they just weren't uh promoted to the top and, 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 uh, some of, some of the best wrestlers weren't uh, big, strong men that, that, uh, you see commonly, um, today, uh, you know, at, at the top, like some of them were actually, um, 
you know, small of small stature of different stature maybe and uh and unfortunately it seems that that uh the you know the actual uh talented wrestlers who are of smaller stature are ignored um or not given as many opportunities as others with with uh larger stature or maybe a certain look and it's what well, it's a pretty pretty big shame if you ask me about that well i agree with you on that note when you come right down to it if this uh, if pro wrestling was a legitimate competition if it was a real thing if it was honestly for real the appearance of a wrestler would make very little or no difference whatsoever it would be what that man can actually do in that ring that would count that would be the main issue the whole thing has become as we both agree it's become a show a circus <laughs> if you ever get the chance uh see the 1957 uh movie with humphrey bogart and rod steiger uh called the harder they fall in actuality that movie was uh, i would say it was like the primo carnever story where um, Bogart took the part of a uh, journalist and Rod Steiger took the part of a uh, corrupted uh, boxing promoter. And he calls Bogart down to the gym uh, one day to show off a new prospect that they just found while traveling abroad. And it was a physical giant, you know, just like Carnero was. And they, um, before they put him in the ring to uh, test him out, Rod Steiger comes off and tells Humphrey Bogart, and I quote, he says, listen, I got, I got a thousand guys over here that can box, but this guy over here has got it in him to pack stadiums. Same thing with wrestlers. I got a thousand guys that can wrestle, but this guy, because of his looks, could pack stadiums. Doesn't mean that he's got to have any talent. Doesn't mean that he can really do anything. Doesn't mean that he's really any kind of a super athlete or anything it's just based on the way he looks and that's what they'll do in order to promote the product it's the same thing like in that movie as it is in pro wrestling today they simply take someone by their appearance and they uh, make some kind of a figure out of them now most unfortunately in the uh, movie uh it, the very his very last fight had to do with the uh, world champion who needless to say could box and this guy couldn't fight his way out of a beauty parlor. <laughs> and he got beaten up so bad he wound up in the hospital. Mm. Because once the promoter got finished with him and made his money on him, he simply didn't need him anymore. So he just threw him to the wind and whatever happened, happened. Well, as I say, pro wrestling it is, has gone the same route. Yeah, and, and speaking of boxing, you mentioned uh, to me... Um, that you were uh that you trained in in boxing and and other martial arts um um can't um yeah you and and you also mentioned something about a uh uh an mma fighter <laughs> you mind sharing that with us yes um i um i was out of retirement about uh three years ago uh, by a new, uh, a brand new out of the box, uh, right off the assembly line, uh, promoter. And, uh, this fellow, let me tell you, the only reason as to why I came out of retirement for him was because he had all the right ideas. He had all the thoughts, intentions, you know, basic purity when you really come right down to it. And I, uh, I felt a little bad for him because I figured, well, what he's doing is the way the business is today, he's spitting into the wind. But nevertheless, let me do what I can to help him along. So um, at a uh, at a reduced pay night, because I knew that he really wasn't going to bring in very much money at this particular show, uh, he matched me against uh, this uh, prominent uh, MMA uh, fighter. Now, I say this, and no brag, that uh, I was 65 years old, and this, this was a, a considerably young fellow. And, you know, mixed martial arts, well, he did anything and everything you can imagine to try to put me down. 
and he even went so far as to haul off with a spinning uh, side snap kick and caught me right smack in the jaw with his foot. Mm. And it was rather surprising when he just saw me looking at him and grinning. Oh, I did snap. not down. I did not get staggered. He did not hurt me. And I'm saying to myself, brother, I'm, I'm going on 66 years old. If this guy can't knock me down, I don't know what kind of uh, what kind of publicity he's going to get in the MMA with uh, these uh, other fighters. I'm an old man for crying out loud, and I'm still standing here. Wow. Wow, that's probably the craziest thing I ever heard of. That's just wow. He's probably, I mean, if he can't do that, I mean, I don't know how he's going to survive an MMA. Wow. <laughs> well, the sad part about it is, is that he's been in MMA for a while, so I don't exactly, uh, I don't follow his record. I haven't followed any string of victories or any, vic or any uh, string of losses or anything of that nature. But uh, all I can say is this. I mean, some people that ask me questions, you know, hey, Duke, you got kicked right smack in the face by that guy, and he didn't even stagger you. So the only thing that I uh, cred uh, credited was, I said, well, let me tell you something. When I came into the business back in 74, if you weren't tough enough to take what they were dishing out, you weren't tough enough to get into that ring. And as you can see, I'm one of the, I'm one of the last survivors of the old Bruno era. And even now, an old man, old man that I am, this young fella could not do a thing that would hurt me, no matter how hard he tried. And let me tell you, he tried his best. So much so, I'll tell you the truth. I felt sorry for him afterwards. Wow. Yeah, that's that's crazy. I mean, wrestlers uh, in professional wrestling, they are some of the toughest of of uh, pretty much all combat sports because even in combat sports, uh, MMA, um, they only host fights like, what, once a year? And... Um, the injuries aren't even that severe as, as they are in professional wrestling. Uh, I mean, if they get injured, they have a lot of time to heal. And, and, uh, but with professional wrestling, wow, it's just, they had to, it's a pretty, wow, it's just stuff they had to endure. And, um, especially with this situation and, and, and people back then, um, it, it was a lot of, uh, they had to endure a lot of punishment, uh, you know, um, I think. Well, look, you know, it's as I was saying, way back in the Bruno era, the uh, concept of uh, steroids were not quite so prominent. Uh, they were few and far between. By today's standards, you see these wrestlers are getting all sorts of injuries that never heal because the steroids that they're using stop the body's healing process. This is why the injuries are so severe. This is why the injuries last as long as they do. See, I personally, like I've told many people, if I thought that steroids were dangerous, I would have used them. If steroids were not illegal, I would have used them. However, you know something with a drug or a chemical that'll do one good thing for your body and it'll do 10 wrong things to it. So therefore, I never indulged. And yet, some time ago, I was able to lift 485 pounds up off the ground with my neck. Wow. That's, that's insane. That's crazy. Was it a deadlift? I did it with my neck. Wow. That is insane. Dang. <laughs> These wrestlers today can't compete with that. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, like I say, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, those were the days, yes, my future in wrestling is only in the past, but I can look back on some, uh, some real glory days, some of the people that I've traveled with, some of the people I've worked with, some of the people I hung out with, it was a very, um, it was a very different thing back then than it is today. And uh, by today's standards, I don't even like the social aspect of uh, pro wrestling because I don't like the people that I would have to uh, intermingle with. 
and uh, I'm just uh, I'm just happy to do as I do. Occasionally, somebody recognizes me, and I'm always happy to sign an autograph for them, or take a picture with them, or just um, talk about uh, old times when you come right down to it. And well, I'm I was lucky enough to leave the business with no uh, critical injuries or any type of uh, domestic uh, problem or anything of that nature. And uh, let's just say I'm very contented in the autumn of my career. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, because, um, you know, people today, they take a whole bunch of now it's it's. It's, uh, I heard that even pro wrestling back then, uh, it became more popular than boxing itself. And that's saying a lot. And now it's, it's, uh, doesn't have that level of respect anymore. Um, um, you know, and, and even some professional wrestlers, uh, uh, it's like now there it's the the athletic aspect of it has gone completely out the window and now um now if they want to get over injuries and whatnot they have it's almost as if they have to resort to drugs and and painkillers to you know to resolve all that and what it's actually doing is is pretty much um you know pretty much destroying their bodies and 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 before you know it, their careers are over within um, within a few years or or so. Um, compared to back then, uh, wow! I wonder how long people could co- keep going back then. Um, back then, they really could have gone quite a distance. So, would you consider take into consideration, okay, the fact that I was going by the uh, old school methods, strictly by the old school methods. Now, I lasted straight across from 1974 to 2001, and if the business was worth having any respect for, I could have gone beyond uh, 2001. Uh, Today, of course, we have a whole different thing because of uh, the types of um, drugs, for one thing, that uh, many of the wrestlers are indulging in. Over the last few years, Look at statistics and see how many wrestlers and people associated with it have died from drug overdose. Yeah, I've, I've seen a bunch of cases of that happening, and they died young. and They died, like, in their 20s. Good Lord. Right. Um, yeah, I know, I know Terry Funk, he lasted for, for like, oh, quite a while, like, over 50 years, and I, I was just shocked reading that. Uh, you know, he's just... I mean, is he? I wonder if he's even still around. I think he he. Uh, I don't know if he retired or whatnot, but he retired like. Uh, he's reti- he's retired a bunch of times, but. Good God. <laughs> well, he retired about as many times as Ric Flair has, and there goes Rick. He's still going at it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and it's a, uh, it's quite a shame how people um. Uh wrestlers now they don't even last not even how many years i think i can't remember but they don't they don't last that long they i mean um i can't remember which wrestler it was but but I, there was this japanese wrestler who who got hit in the head and he suffered one concussion from one kick and and his career was over in the span of I think 20 years and I said dang that's just that's crazy (laughs) well like I say unfortunately there are times when just one simple move is enough to do some very uh, critical irreparable uh, damage it all depends I mean you know if you get kicked in the forehead it's not so bad you get kicked in the temple or the back of your head, chances are you're going to wind up with a uh, cerebral problem. And, uh, you know, like I say, it always depends pretty much on the individual, on their capacity to heal, on their uh, pain threshold, you know, things of that nature. Like I say, I had my nose broken 12 separate times, and each time I set the bone back in place myself. 
So um, wow. old school, new school. You can't compare. You really can't compare the two. I'm just uh, like I say. You know, from time to time, I just uh, say to myself that uh, by today's methods and standards, I'm just another old geezer who's looking back on his career. Now that may be true, but let me tell you, back at that time, you you had to be made out of iron to be a wrestler. <laughs> Straight up like that. <laughs> Um, okay, so my next question is, uh, um, when you're wrestling, what what mindset do you come with in, in your matches, um, you know, facing your, point, uh, your opponent or whatnot, and what's your mindset? Well, it would, it would all depend. It would depend on the uh, opponent. It would depend on the set of circumstances. In general, the first thing I always did before I walked out of that locker room was I just used to zone everything else out. I didn't listen to the fans, didn't pay any attention to them, whether they were uh, booing me or cheering me. I just basically took one narrow-minded, focal approach and just zeroed in on getting in that ring, doing what I had to do any way that I had to do it, and coming out of it uh, the winner. Uh, there had been times, of course, where uh, I had to take on uh, a most unusual uh, attitude. Uh, we had a situation uh, one night at uh, Pace University in uh, Manhattan. And it was one, one of these nights where uh, I was uh, taking care of the locker room, helping with uh, matchmaking and uh, what have you. And, you know, God, God bless Chuck Wepner. You know, they used to call him the Bayonne Bleeder. But I'll say one thing about him. You know, the man was a, he was a natural giant, but he was one of the nicest, good-natured characters that you'd ever come to know. And that night, he was, um, he was a guest referee for the main event. So I already had my hands full with everything that was going on. Uh, problems here, problems there, this and that, and everything else. Now, my opponent, well, you know, just out of respect, I won't mention his name, he approached me uh, beforehand and says to me, he says, I got to ask you a big favor, Duke. I said, Any, anything I could do for you, just to, just to ask. He says, Duke, please, whatever you do, don't use any of those shoot moves or any of those scientific moves or <laughs> anything like that. I'm an entertainer, but I'm not a legitimate wrestler. You know that. <laughs> I told him, I said, oh, for crying out tears, fella, I'm not going in that ring to hurt you. I said, no, I'm why don't you and I just go out there? Come on, we'll have some fun. Okay? I got no intention of doing anything that's going to hurt you. Please, <laughs> knock it off. Okay. Well, so here I was going into the ring with a nervous uh, wrestler. So I had to see to it that whatever I did, I didn't elbow smash him. I didn't forearm smash him. I didn't drop kick him. I didn't do anything that was likely to hurt him. Uh, basically, what I used was just a lot of limp uh, wrestling moves. Now, I told you that so I can tell you this. Chuck Wepner, God bless him, God bless that guy, he approaches me, he pulls me aside, wants to speak to me. And I couldn't quite understand what would be so urgent here. Now, I had to look straight up at Chuck, and he had to look all the way down at me, because like I said, he's a giant. And he says to me, he says, Duke, I'm in trouble. I said, what do you mean you're in trouble? What are, you, what are we talking about? He says, I'm supposed to referee the main event. Well, congratulations, it's an honor. He says, never mind the honor. I never refereed a match before. I said, are you <laughs> kidding me? I said, you oh, must man. be joking. The poor man never refereed before. Wow. And here he is. He's supposed to referee the main event. So, uh, gosh, I'll tell you something. I didn't know if I should be angry, feel pity, or what. But I told him, I said, listen, Chuck, what we're going to do is this. Forget about the main event. You don't have to write. You're not going to uh, take care of the main event. You're going to referee my match. It's the third match. But what I want you to do is, when we get in that ring and I ring that bell, stay as close to me as you possibly can, because all through the match, I'll be telling you what to do as a referee. And I really had my work cut out for me that night. <laughs> but I'll tell you something, I never knew a nicer boxer. Uh, I guess I lost you again. Oh, yeah, well, I don't well, know what happened. Okay. I'm still here, though. Same here. Are you breaking up? Uh, no, 
No, we're, we're back in communication again. Okay. I was about to say. <laughs> okay, so go on. Okay, like I say, I never knew a better guy than Chuck Webner. He was one of the nicest troubles in the world. You know, the uh, Bayonne bleeder. We sat afterwards, we talked, she was telling me about some of his old matches and stuff, and, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a tough piece of work. But I'll say one thing, the guy's got a heart as big as all outdoors. I loved, I loved working with him that night. Yeah, and um, um, another thing I wanted to ask you was uh, was how did you how did you uh, make the transition from the way things that were done in wrestling back then to the way they they were done now? Uh, if there was any sort of uh, change or whatnot. There was very little change when you come right down to it. I was matched predominantly against guys that were extremely tough and were not afraid to get hurt. And by the same token, they weren't afraid to hurt anyone else either. Yeah. So generally, I always seemed to wind up in the ring with them. Uh, that was okay because um, I'd rather work with one, t one guy as tough as an anvil and within the next 10 matches and the next 10 shows than to work with somebody as soft as a cream puff and it's going to start <laughs> crying the second I forearm smash him. <laughs> One of my more frequent opponents, may, may he rest in peace, was uh, Fabulous uh, Firehawk. Now, this fellow, he weighed about 325 pounds. But what really surprised people was he was fast. And his endurance was unbelievable. You know, he, ne he never seemed to get tired. And we, we worked... Plenty of time. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, he's the guy that broke my nose most of the time. He, he was a real trip. Wow. Unfortunately, some years ago, he just um, he let he let things get out of hand with himself, and he gained a tremendous amount of weight. He went up over four hundred pounds, and he became severely diabetic. And when he became diabetic, he really wasn't taking very good care of his health, and as a result, uh, it eventually, uh, you know, it, it it led to his. Uh, untimely death, which was really a shame, because he really, uh, he had a lot of things going for him in the business back then, and uh, he was a, you know, he was a good-natured uh, fellow, he was a very shy type, but he was about as, he was as tough as a patent tank, when you come right down to it, wow. and uh, they used to touch me against him most of the time, may he rest in peace. Yeah, it's a... Uh... You know, it's unfortunate that you see people who, who make a tremendous impact leave the world and like that, and and uh, you know, and then then you gotta. I mean, some of these people, you know, they they're complete legends, and the way their you know their lives end, it's like it's, it's like some of the some of them die really young, and it's it's unbelievable. Um, you know, um, but I mean, other granted others, uh, you know, they live quite a long time and, um, but yeah, I mean, um, so I want to ask you, uh, what was the worst? What were some of the worst mistakes you ever made in wrestling? Well, I I could uh, how, how should I say be cynical and say one of the worst mistakes I ever made in wrestling was getting involved in it in the first place. When I say <laughs> that, but, you know, of course, I won't say that. Uh, one of the biggest the biggest mistake I made was, as I mentioned earlier, bringing in Johnny Diamond as a as a manager, because uh, that also had a very bad reflection on my reputation, also. Yeah. Uh, that was one of them. Then uh, it was a match that I had back in 90, uh, 91, I believe, in April, back in April of 91, against uh, this, uh, he used to call himself a, a self-trained wrestler uh, from uh, Jersey City. Uh, this uh, character, I don't believe, I don't believe he was ever... Uh, Ever the recipient of any red wrestling training, but his family loaned him enough money to uh, get his own federation started. So as his, as this was his federation, 
He also proclaimed himself as the Federation champion. My biggest mistake with him was not only agreeing to a match with him, but I agreed to do a match with him in a steel cage. Oh, God. And, and, <laughs> and I'll tell you why it was a big mistake. Because I just landed him one punch in the stomach. Not in the head, not in the face, in the stomach. And he went down on, on the canvas, face down, and wasn't moving. Ooh, God. Now, what do you do under these circumstances? I stood in that ring. I'm saying to myself, you know something? If I wasn't, uh, if I went, went, wasn't expecting my pay envelope tonight, I would just walk right out the door of the steel cage over here, and I'd be the big time winner. So <laughs> what the heck am I supposed to do to stall for time while this guy uh, re re recovers? We didn't even have the benefit of a referee in that in, in that cage. Oh, man. and I felt like such a jerk because I'm standing here kicking him, yelling at him, "Get up! Nobody's going to believe this!" And he's laying there out cold. Man, that's insane. Though. I mean, I wonder what would have happened if he died or something like that. Oh man. Well, let me let me tell you something, friend. That's <laughs> another thing I worried about. Because this happened in the state of New Jersey. New Jersey had a death penalty back then. Oh, man. <laughs> Dang. So that would that would have ended horribly if, if something like that happened. God. <laughs> well, try, try to help this poor fool to look good went over horribly when you come right down to it. <laughs> I was, I, in all my years, I was never so humiliated. Yeah, and, and that's another thing is, is that it's – it's uh, ridiculous how some of these people, the, these fans, you know, they'll get into a ring and and claim that they're trained professionals, but they're really not. And and then, but then when they start, you know, getting hurt or whatnot, and then, and they start getting beat up, then they want to file a lawsuit. <laughs> it's utterly ridiculous. <laughs> well, most unfortunately, it happens very often these days. I mean, if these characters are not. Uh... If they're not trained and they're not physically tough enough to take what's uh, what's going to be dished out, then uh, for all practical purposes, they ought to get themselves a job behind the counter at a candy store or uh, <laughs> something along those lines. Because uh, pro wrestling back at that time was a tough way to, 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 to make a living. And uh, not everybody really uh, measured up. See, I was, I was lucky in a lot of different ways. Lucky in plenty of ways. Uh, I got started. I already I had two strikes against me when I got started because I ju I'm just barely you know barely five foot seven inches tall. So just like on Rikers Island, I was one of the guys who really had to prove himself. Some people are luckier than that. Some uh, not quite so lucky. There was a uh, back back when I was new. There was a uh, fellow. He worked for uh, Vince uh, Senior uh, called Mike uh, Santa Capito. Now, he had all the attributes and all the talent of a guy who could have been a champion. He had a good physique. He was about six foot five inches tall. He was a good looking guy. And he was, he was ultra talented. He was, he was excellent. Uh, however, he was one of these guys that you always used to see going down at every match. Yeah. Mike Santa Capito was a very smart man too because he took all the money that he earned at that time and he put it all together and he bought himself his own 18-wheeler and went into business. And that's what I call a smart man. Wow. Yeah, people now nowadays when they have money they they uh it seems like they waste they waste it on stuff they don't even need. <laughs> and uh I mean, it's not that you can't, you know, you can't spend money on stuff that you want or, but you, you gotta be smart about it. You know, can't be wasting all of it in one go and, and then have, cause then you're going to have nothing left. I mean, <laughs> you know, well, facts being what facts truly are. If somebody presented me with a million dollars cash tonight, Next year at this time, I'd still have that million because I'm accustomed to uh, living a certain way. You know, uh, 
we don't live extravagantly. We don't spend unnecessary uh, money. I don't gamble. I don't drink. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't live beyond my means. I'm very happy when I have enough to uh, cover all my bills, and uh, maybe just a little extra here and there. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm not. A, I'm not a party animal. I never really have been. Uh, for all practical purposes, and this is no joke, any excessive money I generally uh, generally falls in my hands. I generally wind up spending on my wife anyway. But uh, <laughs> that's about it. You know, yeah. I just live within certain parameters. And I'm just uh, happy to go that way. Yeah, good man. Because <laughs> not, I mean, um, you know, that's something that you should do, and you should use your money for others and not you know, live selfless, selflessly, not, you know, not just think about you all the time. And, um, well, the only extravagant yeah. thing that she and I did over the last few years was uh, we spent a week up in the Poconos together. That was about it. And even that we classified as a honeymoon. So uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much the uh, story. You know, some people, they'll, uh, they'll take cruises every now and then or uh, do something else that's extremely costly. And, uh, you know, we hear they're making all sorts of money, and then we're uh, double-shocked when we find out that all of a sudden they've not only gone bankrupt, but they owe the, they owe the IRS a fortune and everything else. Yeah. And I'm happy I'm not one of those people. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of which, um, you know, I've I've read that in professional wrestling, especially the WWE, they don't even provide health care for their own uh wrestlers and whatnot. And that's that's wow, I don't even know what to say about that. I mean uh the wrestlers themselves have to provide for their own uh well being. They're they're known as uh quote unquote independent contractors. So that's how they were able to like, get out of uh, that and it's really it's really uh, I don't even know what the word is <laughs> well as I say you know this is why I fr I frown on the uh, WWE there's no concern whatsoever for uh, anybody who's employed by them you know health let me tell you something health insurance today is something that's critically needed by everybody. You know, you wind up in the hospital for one reason or another, and the next thing you know, you owe them thirty thousand dollars. You know, because of a hospital stay. If you don't have some type of a health coverage, it can put you in debt for the rest of your life. Even seeing a doctor is a very costly thing. Right. You know, and uh, you know, it's, it's most unfortunate. See, I was covered by. Uh, GHI Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, during and after my uh, tenure with the correction department. However, when I reached 65, they dropped that and they uh, had me go directly to uh, Medicare. So at least, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to know that if I have to see a specialist, the most I got to pay that specialist is 20 bucks and they, they take care of all the rest. Because if I had to go full swing on uh, doctor's expenses when I see them, which fortunately is not that often, <laughs> I I go bankrupt within six months. Yeah, it's crazy how how uh, you know the healthcare system is. Uh, I I think I lost my uh, I lost my my uh, health insurance like years ago, and now they're now uh, now I'm in debt, and and I don't even know how to get out of it. I just, sometimes I just get like. Oh man, I gotta pay this amount, dang. Um, whereas back then it was easy, you know, paying uh, twenty bucks or maybe not even paying at all because the healthcare has got your back. But uh, you know, it's just crazy how things have have uh, you know. Well, depending upon income, you can always uh, pay for uh, healthcare separately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, pretty much. And Obamacare costed, I remember when that was around, it costed like uh, 20 bucks a month. Um, but then they took that away. So, 
now we're stuck with I don't even know what we have now, but but uh <laughs> yeah. So um my last question is uh to wrap this up is is where can people find you at? I mean you have any um particular sites or you wanna mention or whatnot? Well I can tell I can tell you this. Uh my uh my wife and I frequently we're usually having dinner at the Floridian Diner in, uh, in the Marine Park area at least, at least once a week. Uh, there have been a couple of cases there with a few reporters who uh, went in there uh, on occasions when we were not there and uh, spoke with um, the major D or somebody behind the register and they wanted to know where they could locate me. And, uh, of course, uh, they always uh, you know took the information down and passed it to me once I came in. So... Uh, that's, uh, I would say that the Floridian Diner is a frequent uh, hangout. Uh, I enjoy, like I, said, I enjoy taking my wife there at least once a week uh, because I enjoy showing her off when you really come like that. So <laughs> quite a woman. Uh, yeah, I hear that. <laughs> yeah, who wouldn't want to show off? I mean, if you have someone special in your life and who's great to you, I mean, I'd show off too. <laughs> But you see, uh, her history is another, uh, is a completely different story in itself, and it's a, it's a uh, tragedy of uh, sorts because she used to be, she used to be in the entertainment business. Uh, she was a belly dancer. She did some acting. Uh, she was pretty good at it, but unfortunately, she was involved. You know, she was married at the time, uh, and involved in a very uh, destructive and an extremely violent. Uh, relationship where her uh, husband was uh, beating her like on a daily basis. Oh, so when uh, she uh, sued him for divorce and uh, he wound up with jail time as well, uh, she got word, you know, word hit the street that he was out on the street and he was, uh, he was looking for her. So she, uh, she approached me and uh, she asked me if I would be her, uh, you know, could, could I be her bodyguard? Uh, bottom line was I took the job. But then again, okay, I stayed her bodyguard for quite some time, but I wasn't going to make the same mistake that uh, Kevin Costner made with Whitney Houston, and uh, I married her. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's uh, quite a way to bodyguard somebody. <laughs> well, let's, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, she was in a lot of trouble. I mean, she was living in mortal fear. She was... Uh, she was afraid to leave the apartment. You know, she was always afraid something was going to happen. And I know what it's like to be afraid to have uh, nobody, uh, no, nobody around to help you. So when we sat down and uh, talked, you know, I told her, you know, as many times as I've worked as a bodyguard, I've worked many times as a bodyguard. Uh, I have a certain set uh, fee, usually, depending. And unfortunately, you know, she told me that she would pay my uh, weekly uh, uh, fee for uh, protection, but that would have left her with like uh, twenty dollars uh, at the end of the week, uh, you know, for her expenses and stuff. And I couldn't see her starving like that, so I did something. And I told her, I said, "Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something I never did before. I'm going to I'm going to waive the uh, fee expenses, but since I'm working a night job, I'm free during the day. So whatever you got to do during the day, I can accompany you." But I'm not going to ask you for any money. And uh, frankly speaking, I'm, I'm glad that I didn't. Wow. Because it really blossomed into something I really wasn't expecting. Wow. <laughs> Quite an amazing story you got there. <laughs> well, well, you see, it was, like I said, it was a very weird uh, uh, situation for me anyway because... Uh, as I said, I have worked many times as a bodyguard, but this is the first time I did not work as a bodyguard for some millionaire or for some big-time businessman or for some uh, Canal Street jeweler or somebody who was carrying mega bucks. Yeah. This is the first time that I was actually working as a bodyguard for a uh, divorced uh, woman uh, who... Uh, was, uh, like I said, she was really living in mortal fear. And it, what was strange was the fact that I was not in the market at the time for an interracial relationship. 
And as I say, things just happened a certain way. Yeah. Wow. Cause yeah, cause not many people are willing to do stuff like that. And, uh, and in her situation, I mean, men like that are dangerous because, um, you know, you don't know their histories and whatnot and, and they're very violent and, uh, who knows if you weren't there for her, probably, she probably would have been killed or something. And so more it's, than likely, that yeah. more than likely would have been, been the big outcome. You know, as far as, you know, violence, violent people, crazy people, things of that nature. Isaiah, I can tell you this. I've lived with violence all of my life. And I wasn't going to be more, more afraid then than I ever was before. Believe me. Wow. You know, I put 20 years in on, uh, you know, they call it the rock. I put 20 years, 20 years in at Rikers Island. At least once a week I was knocking somebody cold. And uh, generally, uh, anybody that anybody that I had an altercation with was generally bigger than I was, but yeah. that didn't stop me from beating them. So this uh, this was just a drop in a bucket. This wow. was definitely uh, that that nothing to me. But fortunately, <laughs> everything worked out. Yeah, thank God for that. Um, yeah. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you and hosting this interview. Um. You know, I really enjoy talk, uh, getting to know you more. And um, is there any last words you want to say before we wrap this up? Well, I do want to say that the pleasure was uh, strictly and entirely my own. I enjoy, uh, I enjoyed very much uh, speaking with you. I'm uh, glad I was able to at least get some of my most uh, inner feelings and resentments. Uh, uh, how would I say, uh, going to uh, public? Uh, giving my reasons why, and uh, to let uh, to let the fans know, those who uh, recall me, that uh, even though I'm uh, no longer uh, involved in the business, I'm still around and I'm still real, and I'm and I'll be I'll be 68 on my next birthday, and if God grants it, I'll live another 68 years after that. Yeah, Amen. Okay, pleasure talking to you. Likewise, Isaiah. Call me anytime at all. Okay. Okay. Thank you again. Okay.